okay let's start i will uh, sure. first introduce and then you can take over great thanks dr mohan so i would like to welcome all of you back after the lunch and uh, a very good morning to dr shila ditya there thanks dr mohan <laughs> yes so this is the third session uh, for the day for us here right so i would like to welcome dr shila ditya mitra uh, who is currently a senior post doctoral researcher in max planck institute of psychiatry germany so the topic which he will be discussing with all of us is emerging technologies in preclinical and basic neuroscience uh, scope for engineers so before going ahead uh, i would like to introduce him to all of you so he has done his btech in biotechnology from vit in india he has uh, completed phd in csir center for cellular and molecular biology in hyderabad uh, his area in phd is neuroscience uh, by uncovering the mechanisms of action of an understudied gene called wdr13 in brain one of the important findings of his research was the importance of this gene in homeostasis and in regulating depression like symptoms uh, post doctoral research at uh, brain city embl uh, so earlier he was in nensky institute of experimental biology and uh, he also worked in collaboration with physicists optical engineers and uh, people from the background of informatics so with this short introduction i would like to welcome dr shila ditya for his session here and uh, uh, over to you sir great thanks a lot dr amol for organizing this and um yes so once you will right great uh so i share this in just one second right so i guess that uh, my screen is being shared right now please just let me know if it is uh, yes it's being uh, shared yeah it's being shared yeah yes now your screen is visible yeah okay right can you see the presentation yes yes please go ahead wait wait okay uh, so maybe you so can click uh, that hide button yeah yeah okay you are seeing that also <laughs> yeah. right okay um I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. It's somehow there is a glitch in Mac, so it's like. Um, acha, acha. No issues, no issues. I'm just, I'm just. Whenever I'm clicking, it's just going away from that. No I problem. I try to move it down. Yeah, exactly. This is what happened. Okay, this should be fine, right? Yes. Is is down from the presentation um, screen. Okay, uh, so um, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, what I'll be talking today is uh, basically giving a brief overview of a few of the interesting technological areas in preclinical and basic neuroscience. Like I have been working on basic neuroscience for uh, more than a decade right now, and when I started, I started as a molecular biologist. Though you know, like I had a BTEC in biotechnology and had a a um, course with informatics but uh, the more and more that i am delving deep into neuroscience right now i could see that the field has progressed deeply into depending on technology and informatics so um of course you know like there are multiple areas of neuroscience where there are, uh, are a lot of importance of uh, machine learning of neuroinformatics but i'll be just focusing on uh, two key broad areas which are of uh, interest right now to people and they will form the basic of neuroscience research for at least the next 6 uh, 7 years to come and holds uh, immense um, opportunity for other people coming in from varied backgrounds uh, to put their contribution in neuroscience so before i go in much into you know like uh, i just wanted to talk a little bit of biology over here and 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 a little bit of the background so brain has is a complex organ it has got different number of cell types but the most 
important cell type that the brain has is the neurons you know uh, uh, everyone knows it is high school textbook uh, what we have over here in this uh, figure is the action potential of a neuron because neurons they fire and depending upon the exchange of ions between inside through the inside of the neuron and its external environment it creates a change in the potential that causes uh, uh, electric uh, an action potential over here which can be detected by uh, electrodes uh, because it's uh, conduct through electro communicating through electric uh, potentials so what you see over here is a depolarizing wave and then goes back for repolarization when the ions come back flux in and then it goes hyperpolarization and resting phase so when you see the neurons firing this is called a firing of a neuron you'll see a curve like this you'll see an action potential like this um, there have been many uh, because neurons are electrical in nature, so people have been trying to recreate the function of a neuron. And this is over here is a three transistor model of uh, a fast spiking neuron in the brain. Uh, these were initially the areas, and these are the basically the component. Uh, the, these kinds of designs and of of an electrical neuron are basically what's behind neurocomputing. So these were the areas where technology was uh, during the 90s and early 80s. Even technology was pouring in. To neuroscience is to design and have like a model of a neuronal connection so if you have two brain regions connected uh, by different kinds of neurons because there are different neurons you know, types in the brain so you would try to generate a electrical model of that and see you know like and run it through your uh, simulation to see how they would be interacting and how they would be behaving in you know like in times when the, uh, not many animal researches uh, could be done or they were severely limited um, but as you know that, you know, neurons are a plenty in the brain. There are billions of neurons. As you can see over here, this is an image taken from a mice that has been injected with a virus that expresses different, like uh, one kind of single fluorescence protein, but then they are truncated to give different colors. And as you can see, this area is completely messy with so many projections of the neurons coming out. Uh, this is the hippocampus region of the brain, which is important for memory and learning. Uh, so on this, so you, so it's quite complex, as you can see over here, and um, it's not just understanding single neurons and their action potentials and their um, electrophysiological properties, but to understand this neural ensemble and how they react to the environment is something that we are trying to understand. And the more that we'll understand uh, using preclinical models like mice and rats and monkeys. Uh, is that we can translate it to human beings and you know like we can know about the diseases we can know about how brain functions under different conditions like stress or when you're learning or when you're going outside facing heat you're drinking a coffee you're having a chocolate how the brain is functioning you're addicted to something you like something these are all the questions that are yet unanswered memory how it is formed and through basic and preclinical neuroscience we are trying to address those questions so as i've been telling you know like technology like all, uh, in neuroscience already exists there uh, has been machine learning and uh, in in cases of fmri mri in brain machine interfaces in psychiatric research informatics is already there in genetic research where people understand uh, how different gene expressions happening in different regions of the brain. And it's a huge amount of data. And when you have a huge amount of data, you shall require people to do analysis. Uh, the most common applications are electrophysiology, in which, uh, as in the previous slide, I told that uh, the action potential. So electrophysiology sees the way these action potential in the uh, neurons are affected in the different regions and you basically do it with a clamp in electrodes or it's called a patch clamp technique in which you put electrodes and you measure the changes and it will tell you uh, quite clearly about if there are differences between when you have different conditions so, um, but what I'll be talking about is uh, something a little bit different from these tech because they are already there and I guess that a lot of speakers who have been there um, before because I was seeing the program it's quite intense have been talking about different aspects of such analysis so I'll be skipping those parts because those are pretty common people know about it uh, what I'll be going is uh, right now going into more interesting topics 
uh, topics which are prevalent. So uh, I'll divide my talk into two parts. First is the application of electronics. Uh, where I'll be talking about few where there are direct application of electrical components in without which we cannot do the behavioral analysis or any experiments. Uh, and the second shall be machine learning. So I'll go on to my first part, which is on the application of the electronic components directly. And the first thing that comes to mind and the most interesting research right now is optogenetics. So what's optogenetics? If you break down the term, so it's basically optics and genetics. So everyone knows right now that, you know, uh, each of the cells of the body, they express different genes. Um, neurons are no different, you know, neurons express different genes. And uh, as uh, many people do research, I have done research, each of these expression of the genes changes or the function of a neuron, how the neurons function, like uh, I had been working on this gene called WDR13, as Amol uh, um, uh, uh, told earlier, and then I had been doing an MMP9, FKBP, and each of these genes have a different role in stress, in depression, in the neuronal functions. So what you basically do is that you, ex you, you um, exploit a principle of neuron that I told that the neurons exchange ions between its external and internal environment. Uh, so what you can do is that if you can express in the neuron a certain kind of uh, ion channel called a uh, channel rhodopsin uh, forcefully, uh, and this is usually done with a virus, yes, the same kind of virus that is causing COVID-19, not, not the same, but the principle is the same, it causes infection to the cell, it expresses a few of these proteins which are engineered because it's an engineered virus, and once you uh, express this, uh, protein, or this is actually a transmembrane uh, channel, what it does is that it causes an influx of sodium ions that opens up the neuron or causes the neurons to fire. Um, and uh, so this is what you do is that, uh, but these channels are actually responsible to blue light. Uh, so what you do is that once these channels express and if you shine a blue laser onto the neuron, these channels will open and let the sodium in, just causing a firing of a neuron. Or what you do is that you create an on switch for this neuron. And the similar thing can be repeated differently by using another kind of protein called a halorhodopsin, which on emission of a yellow light causes uh, influx of chloride ions inside the cell, just changing the potential or shutting down a neuron. So this is called an off switch. So basically it is an on and off switch that you can use to turn on a neuron and turn off a neuron just by expressing these kinds of proteins and by light. So this is called optogenetics. This has an immense potential these days in understanding how neuronal ensembles function because you can express them in different regions of the brain and shut or on or shut off its function. And thus you will be knowing that which small neuronal subtypes or which brain regions has different function. As you can see over here in this image, it's a mice which has an optical fiber inserted. Uh, Dr. Into... Shila Dikta? Yes. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Actually, some voices coming. Yeah, yeah, actually, some... uh, yeah let, me, let me identify. Yeah, sure. Sure, sure. Uh, Vimlesh, uh, are you there? Can you please? Vimlesh, actually I am unable to remove also. Vimlesh, okay, I will try to get a mobile number and try to contact. Okay, no worries. Yeah, please, please go ahead. No worries, no worries, I can hold on. Yeah. Also. Haan, muted. I have muted. Correct, correct. Uh, please uh, continue. Uh, yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, so what you can see over here in this image of uh, this mice is that an optical fiber has been inserted into the skull of the mice, and uh, the blue light is being shining. Obviously, going to have some effect on this uh, behavior of this mice. 
uh, expressing these genes. So these, you know, like being coming from, from most of you guys will be from electronics, electrical, informatics background. So this is an active area of research, and there is a lot to be done over here, and particularly if you're uh, coming from an electronics background. Uh, going to the um, an experimental paradigm, I'll just tell about an experiment that I had performed in in brief over here. So as I told that, you know, like there can be on switch and off switch. So there are both experiments over here done. So there's a region of the brain called the amygdala. So what I did was I expressed um, uh, this virus, which was expressing channel rhodopsin, which is the on switch in, uh, uh, in the, um, but, but don't bother about this now. What this figure tells over here is that when you give sugar, which is, uh, which elicits a, uh, a liking kind of response because everyone loves sugar, mice loves sugar particularly. And you can see uh, as compared to the control uh, in the experimental animal, which has been given sugar on uh, an appetitive preference task, you know, like it's called technical jargon. Uh, you can see more neurons in this region, which is the same region uh, getting fired up in a more synchronous way. So that we know that, you know, like this region is involved in press preference and, you know, like, uh, and mice, when it likes sugar, you know, like these neurons, they glow up, they turn up, um, they show more activity because this is a CFOS leveling is a marker for neural activity or actually plasticity. So then we decided to, you know, like what will happen if we shut these neurons off over here, you know, like will it affect the uh, function of the mice or the rat? So we did this experiment in rats, and this is called a Skinner box experiment in which uh, uh, I'll go shortly through the behavioral paradigm is the mice goes and presses this liver and it gets a food dispenser over here, but it is trained through loudspeaker lights and electrified grid to, you know, like go and press the liver uh, on its own. And whenever, so technically the idea is that whenever the laser, uh, whenever the, la the loudspeaker and the lights are on, the mice gets a response to go over there and um, uh, like it, it gets stopped, it freezes, but if not, the mice goes and gets the food from there. Uh, we express in this uh, rats, uh, sorry, not mice, rats, um, this halorhodopsin, which in this amygdala region, which we saw earlier was involved in place preference or uh, this liking uh, thing towards sugar. And we, uh, of course, had a laser as similar uh, in the previous picture lighting onto this region in, as through the optical fiber. So uh, this, what this graph shows over here is that uh, normally when you have the sound on and the laser on and you know, like uh, without any of this uh, affecting, the rat can go over there and you know, like um, get, get the dispenser from the food. But when you have just a laser on and there is no training over here, uh, it shuts down the neurons and thus shuts down the uh, likeness that this rat will go and press the liver and get the food. So it reduces uh, the appetitive or this having sweet water preference uh, as compared to the controls, uh, or which, is, which are the mice that were not injected or injected with some virus that is not expressing this, uh, and increases the freezing behavior in the Skinner box. So this is, uh, you know, like a kind of experiment that many people are doing right now in which, you know, like they are trying to understand the neural ensemble function. Uh, and as I told you that because of the component of this uh, amazing uh, uh, concept of having this optical fiber emitting light onto this ensemble of neurons, you can control the behavior of these. Uh, in a similar manner, what we have, because uh, I was telling, because you know about electrophysiology in which uh, the first slide I showed that you can check the axon potential. Uh, those were done mostly from patch clamped or cells which are grown on cell culture, you know, like neurons which are grown on cell culture. But when you were doing in vivo, like a mice over here, you know, like which is freely moving. So what you design are something which are called electrodes, multiple electrodes, or even better are optrodes. So optrodes are derived from multiple electrodes, which you'll be putting inside the brain. And when you put multiple electrodes inside the brain, it will give you a reading from different layers of the brain, different new, because each of these uh, small dots that you're seeing are basically electrodes, and these are the big spikes. So you'll be getting information from the neuronal activity from different layers of the brain through each of these uh, electrodes, and thus 
generate a huge amount of data. But what if we wanted to tie it up with uh, the optogenetics principle that uh, I told before, you know, like you uh, shine light, you activate one region or, you know, like you shine light and deactivate one region and see how the neurons are behaving over there, get the information, electrical component information out of those neurons. So design something called an optrode, which has the optical fiber and the um, electrodes over there. So uh, it's, it looks kind of something like this, um, uh, in which you know, like uh, the blue laser shall be emitting a light onto that part of the mice brain in which you had injected the virus, thus causing changes the, in the neurons over there. And then you re record these with the uh, electrodes, uh, the signals and how the neurons are firing. Uh, the kind of information that you get over here is something like this after you run it through MATLAB or Python programming, because first you'll get raw data and then you'll get a heat plot like this. And, and there are several lines over here. Actually, it looks like a, a painting, but uh, there are actually several lines over there. And each of these lines represent one single neuron uh, and the firing of each of these neurons. So you see over there that, you know, like in general, apart from this small block over there, so this is the general firing of the neurons that you will be expecting uh, when, you know, like in, in that particular region from where the analysis is happening. It's more or less uniform. But when you have this blue light shining on, uh, and this is uh, basically, uh, or, or, you know, like causes more firing of the neurons, you see that uh, uh, there is a change in the activity that you are recording from here, particularly in this small time interval during which the blue light was on. So this is how you measure the behavior of the mice. You because the mice is free moving, so it can do its behavior. Though there is, of course, something attached to his head. But after some time, mice get used to this, yeah. and uh, you can know about the behavior of the mice. You can record a lot of data. Yeah. And I'm sorry. Um, am, am I audible? Yeah. Yes, sir. Please go. Right. Sure. Um, so yes, so uh, as you can see that you can get a treasure trove of information from this, uh, but of course you require uh, a lot of electrical components. As you can see, uh, people of you who are like uh, involved in electronics, again, will be able to appreciate it more. And uh, also for people from the informatics background, we are end users. So we have uh, the MATLAB libraries plotted out so that we can get when you churn in the data, we get uh, uh, data out like this, more or less standardized of how to get this information out and reflect the behavior of uh, mice. Uh, in similar manner, there is something called fiber photometry. And what I can do is that actually I can show you a video. Uh, but let me tell you first is that uh, as, I, as one principle that I told is the action potential of a neuron, there's also something called the calcium wave of a neuron in which the neuron takes in calcium and uh, and then it glows. So if I can go back, because I had uh, kept a YouTube video. So if you see over here, these are some uh, neurons which are uh, injected with a dye, which emits uh, light when uh, light shines on it so that we can see the neurons inside the brain, because otherwise you cannot see anything. And then you'll be seeing what is. Is, is this uh, visible, this uh, YouTube uh, video? Yes. yes. Right, right. Okay. So you can see over here, if you can see, is that yes, you can see those neurons glowing. So this is what is happening is that there is a calcium flux, which is changing inside those neurons. And that's, you know, like you can see this beautiful uh, glowing of the neurons, uh, the neurons throbbing, actually. So I didn't have a video of mine. So I could had to take up a video from the internet, but I hope that solves the purpose of it. Um, so anyway, so again over here, what it does is that this is a fiber photometer, uh, and this is called a fiber photometry in which you put an optical fiber again into because uh, those neurons won't be visible until unless you uh, show the light on that, and uh, this and then this optical fiber also records information back from the region of the brain where the virus expressing so in Kiel's case a GCAM6. Uh, and this is different from the electrical component because this shows neurons which are active uh, and the population of neurons which are active. So suppose you are interacting with someone or interacting with something. So there are certain populations of the neurons in the brain that will fire. 
So this is one uh, way that you can see which neurons firing because there are multiple neurons in the region. So it's not that all the neurons will be firing, but a subset of the neurons will be firing. So you can see the subset of the neurons that will be firing using this technology. And again, this would not have been possible if uh, there would not have been a development of the electrical or electronics component of this, uh, which is um, exemplified in this figure in which you have a bidirectional optical fiber, which uh, excites the cells as well as takes information from those cells and then transfer this information back to uh, the computer into a more usable form. Then again, you run it through my Python or MATLAB and you get um, uh, data out of it. They're saying that how many neurons and what's the spatial distribution and what's the sequence of firing of, or what regions they are firing. So a lot of information you can get out of it. What's shown in this figure here, you know, like how it looks like it's, around five millimeter, the longest ones, 3.5 millimeter, and each of them has got multiple, uh, like the ends has, uh, so you can like uh, a mice, this will cover multiple regions of a mouse brain because a mouse brain is small and get a treasure trove of information out of it, like how different regions are firing. So I told you like three examples right now, of, like, and these three are particularly used uh, immensely in understanding the behavior and the firing of neurons. And if you are uh, coming from electronics background, there is uh, a monopoly actually of one company called Thor Labs, which designs um, these kinds of components. And if we have to order or purchase any components, we usually just go to Thor Labs because they have the premium service. The thing is that because they have almost a monopoly in the market, the prices are quite expensive. And it, I, I would love to see, you know, like, some of you would be, you know, like turning entrepreneurs or, you know, like or many other entrepreneurs will be coming up to design electronics chips, which are important for or, or design some changes in some electronic uh, boards, which will be enabling us to uh, ex do such experiments as exemplified before or, you know, like design some more different kinds of experiments. So if you are interested into, you know, like uh, uh, that, you know, like electronic and electronics components are used in basic research of animal research you can just go to thor labs you can just see what they are doing uh, what are the different components that they are making and how uh, you know like you can be implementing those into your uh, research or you know like into your uh, entrepreneurship if any of you would be interested in that so this was more or less the electronic components in like uh, uh, of, of the different electrical uh, aspects of basic neuro which are super interesting. Uh, I'll go back right now to something which is related to machine learning in, in, uh, in neuroscience, in basic neuroscience. So when I talk about machine learning, of course, you know, like you have heard, you guys are from informatics or engineering backgrounds. So this is nothing, something new to you. You have been hearing machine learning in fMRI, in MRI, in brain scanning images, in, in different applications, uh, in biomedical engineering, different applications. So you know about TensorFlow. This is uh, the most commonly used right now for neural networks and for generating algorithms. And uh, the few softwares that I'll be telling henceforth use all use TensorFlow uh, for their deep learning and for the neural networks that and for the training purposes. Um, it's pretty easy, uh, TensorFlow, to integrate into your software because of obvious reasons which i which you guys know but then uh, just for the sake of it uh, what it does over here is basically uh, as in school you would be doing some empirical formulas you know like you are given like a set of data and then you generate a formula to fit it so Hello, this is sir. what it yes yeah, sir sorry to interrupt you uh, i just want to inform you that few uh, participants are from a uh, pharmaceutical background and a few are from biomedical as well ah, okay so then so then i maybe i'll just explain a little bit uh, in details yeah thank uh, you sir. right sure of course great uh, so then tensorflow what it does is that it's you, you can get it easily you know like in it's it's actually um, supported by google right now so uh, anything that you see in your smartphones you know like you uh, use you use google lens you look at something and you see that what object it is, or you know, like you scan a QR code or any of these stuff. They're all based on deep learning, machine learning, or you know, like you are taking a selfie, you just smile towards a camera, the camera clicks. 
So they're all based on algorithms of face detection of that Facebook uses. They're all based on deep learning networks. And TensorFlow, if you are a beginner or even if you're an advanced guy, TensorFlow is the most easiest of them all. It has got very simple algorithms. You can incorporate them. You can learn it. You can just design an app to do that. Uh, and uh, how TensorFlow works, uh, this is a very simple example of, of uh, data fitting, is that if you have a set of data for x and a set of data for y, and you do a model fit that x is equal to uh, y, and you know, like it just fits one point to another point, and then you run it through 500 times iterations. So what it does is 500 times it will be like fitting the different iterations, running it through uh, the program, similar to that kind of that you have been doing in school days, that you have been given a set of data, and you generate uh, the closest equation that you can get, you know, like a, a is equal to b, or a plus b is equal to c, or if you have a corresponding a, then what will be a corresponding b? So this is what the machine does over here. You know, like it does not have an uh, equation. What it does is that depending upon what you have fed into it, so it tries to keep on corresponding to it. And the more number of iterations that you give, here I had given like a 500 iterations. You can go 1,000, 10,000. So the machine runs it. And the more times of iteration it does, the lesser the loss is and the lesser there are the chances of error. So when you do, like you say, like a print model, model predict seven in which you have uh, an, uh, a given input over here in which minus one would be corresponding to three, zero to four, one to five. So you will be getting a value which is close to 11, but may not be completely 11. So this forms the basic of a neural network and machine learning. And this is what is being used in all the future subsets of the programs that I'll be talking about. But this is the basic of it. Like, you generate uh, a training network based on your model, and then you keep on training it multiple times till the point of time your error becomes less. And it comes close to the actual value that you are supposed to get. But instead of doing it by yourself, when you have a large data set, you just have a network to do it for you. So uh, one of the first applications for this is brain functional and projection maps. So many of you who are, again, like from uh, biomedical and pharmaceutical backgrounds, you must be seeing the projection functional maps for in case of fMRI or MRI. And you'll be seeing how, you know, like if there are activity changes or if there are changes, they're plotted onto certain regions of the brain. And you just go and you say, when you finally get the data, you say, oh, this is the region of the brain which is getting affected. You have uh, changes of activity, say, suppose in the hippocampus or say, suppose in the amygdala or different uh, uh, regions of the brain. But uh, when you're coming for analysis in cases uh, of uh, mice brain, you know, like uh, this is getting more and more interesting because we are delving deeper. We are del deeping into uh, single neuron functions, single neuron functional and projection maps, uh, which will help us to understand and extrapolate it to human beings uh, to understand a uh, greater picture. So uh, again, I'll give a little bit of biology. So what's shown over here in this picture is the advancement of a certain kind of technique, which has been developed over the past uh, five, six years. Actually, it's a very recent technique, which is called clearing the brain. So this is done post hoc or after the experiments performed. So what it does is basically uh, any tissue that you will get uh, something like this, you know, like your muscles, the brain, because it has uh, lipids inside it, it has got pigments inside it, so you know, like it will be opaque in general. But what this technique does, uh, there are like three techniques described, four techniques described over here, the four most important techniques, is that they optically clear the brain. So what they do is that basically most of them take out the lipid components and retain the structure of the brain so that the brain structure is there, as well as the internal components. So that's the reason you can see these beautiful neurons. Uh, when you uh, do microscopy on these brains. And there's a special kind of microscope that is used to analyze these brains because they are, uh, they're not just slices. They're not just one section, but it's a complete 3D brain. And it's called a light sheet microscopy because you have basically uh, the scanning is in one plane or one sheet of area. So or a, so light planners microscopy. So you get uh, information of the neurons in the different regions of the brain and the entire map over here of the brain. Uh, uh, thanks to the clearing, you know, like uh, a normal microscope is limited to how much it can penetrate inside the tissue because it's opaque, but because of clearing, you can go much into uh, 
understand the finer structures. And um, if you are from someone from the pharmaceutical background, I know a couple of doctors who had been working with us in, when I was in my previous lab, who were analyzing different uh, molecules in different regions of the body, not just brain, because I'll be just talking about brain, but they were analyzing the heart, the muscles, and employing these techniques to understand the distribution, the kinetics of these the, under different experimental conditions. And uh, I'll show a short video over here because I stained the brain against one molecule called DAP32. And when you can see over here, this is a clear brain. That's why you cannot see much of the outline. But what you can appreciate are uh, these uh, regions which are like highly stained. Uh, some sparse staining and this beautiful projections that are coming from one region to the other region of the brain. So this is what we will be seeing more and you and, and people in neuroscience are doing more because uh, the time has gone when people will be focusing on one region and right now people is, are coming off this advance of technologies is focusing on the entire uh, brain regions of and the distribution of different molecules seeing the different projections. But you have a treasure trove of information over here uh, if I would want to understand that which region in like my region, how the intensity is, then what I have to do in, in normal conditions is have to open a reference map of the brain. Here, this is a mice brain reference map. Uh, this is a region which is called the amygdala, which is involved in fear learning. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, uh, right. Uh, I thought, you know, like uh, I was not audible. Am I, am I audible, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, okay. Sir. Yeah, okay. Great. Uh, so what you can see over here is this is the amygdala, which is uh, involved in fear learning and memory. Uh, and uh, this is the same staining as earlier. So if I would be doing the analysis. I would be, so suppose I'm, con so this is an experiment in which I stressed um, uh, and uh, postnatally and uh, having seen the changes in the brain. Uh, then I'll be manually pulling this reference map up compare because it's light sheet so i'll be uh, sectioning it in one sheet and then you know like seeing each section by sections what are the differences it's okay if you have like a region of interest like in this case i had a region of interest of uh, the amygdala so i can see in this region how the changes are there but if you want to see throughout the brain it it gets next to impossible so in this case you know like uh, when i was showing you the firing of the neurons in the as in uh, the um, the changes of the calcium levels, there is another way that you can uh, check for the, let's say, plastic or activity of changes of the neurons, and it's called using a marker which is called CFOS, uh, which is an immediate early gene, but doesn't matter. Over here, there's a brain which has been stained with CFOS. It marks and labels most of the neurons that has been uh, undergoing changes or undergoing uh, activity uh, changes, uh, and um, this is how it looks like when you see the brain in details, you know, like it's completely packed. Uh, it's, there are a lot of these cells that has been labeled. And when, if you would want to get information out of this, in general, it's next to impossible if you would want to understand and compare it between your uh, experimental and between your controls. So here comes the usefulness of uh, a software which was developed based on Python and TensorFlow, which is called the ClearMap. Uh, what ClearMap does is that it has basically two important components within it. It's, one is called a wobbly stitcher and one is cell map. So the wobbly stitcher is, has the same algorithm as you do like when you're shooting a panorama, like, you know, like it overlaps the images and then it creates a more fluidic picture instead of having this gray zones, which you would be having earlier times in the earlier panorama, which would be taking each frame by each frame and then try to stitch those frames. But instead of doing stitching of the frames, what you do is that you overlap the frames and take up the most common regions and then you have a more fluidic uh, thing. Uh, so that's that's what exactly this does. It does a wobbly stitching job because you have to compare it to the uh, reference uh, brain that I showed over here. Uh, so the idea is to have the brain stitched up completely and then superimpose onto this reference brain uh, so that and it is it, and it can be more fluidic and there are no gaps because then you'll not be understanding which region is which and where it is more expressed and then you have the cell map so here what you do is that you train the network and you train the network to distinguish between a single signal and what is a background and what are cells and then you just put it into it and it derives and generates a map 
So how does it work normally is that you correct the illumination because it's a whole brain, so different region will be diff illuminated differently. You do a background removal like it has been done over here. You do an equalizing uh, and uh, the Gaussian filter, the maximum detection, cell shape detection, and then cell intensity. So what you can, uh, okay, I'm getting an error message is, um, I'm sorry, just. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll just restart it once. I'm sorry for this. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just. I think I just cut into. Uh, uh, okay. Is I, I share the screen? Is it visible? The screen. Yes. 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 It is visible. Uh, right. Okay. Because I'm not getting that message anymore. Okay. Anyways. Right. Uh, so anyway, so I was going back, you know, like how, how you train the network and how you, so what you do over here is that now you select the regions which you mark it as cells and then you label them and then you run, like you capture each frame by frame because over here, as I showed that, you know, like there will be, so this, if this is the entire plot, uh, if this is the entire plot, you will get each frame by frame, something like this. So then you go through different frames uh, um, you, and, you, and you label. And then you run through a network. And when you run through a network, then you have your network trained. And then you just apply, and then you'll get the data. So this is one example of a project, um, which is not my paper. It's, it's someone else's. Uh, but uh, this is a more detailed one. So I thought that this would be easier for you to understand. So what they had done over here in this experimentally is that they wanted to know which neurons uh, are heat sensitive. So if you are given, uh, suppose if the mice is subjected to 38 degrees Celsius, which of the neurons they fire up? So this is the control brain, and this is how it looks like. They have done the same C4 staining of it and using multiple brains and then superimposing and generating a p-value map. And these are the heat maps. You see that the neurons which will be firing, and this is all generated using the clear map technology that uh, I just talked about before. And then you, when you have the mice which has been exposed to more heat, then you have different regions of the brain firing up. Uh, and this is what is exemplified in this uh, figures over here. And uh, when you superimpose onto the atlas, which is, which is exactly what ClearMap does, then you can generate a map plot like this, which has which are the regions of the brain where you get activity under different uh, conditions, which has an increase in activity, which has a decrease in activity. And these are all can be done very easily. So once you have your network ready, you just put it, and um, then it just runs these iterations, mapping it onto uh, the cleared brain onto the reference brain, and then uh, plotting the different cells which are expressing CFOS onto the uh, reference brain, and then giving you this analysis output. A similar thing that can be done is that, as you saw in my picture over there, there are a lot of these projections. And, if I would be knowing that which region to another region these projections are going or have like an entire projection map, then uh, manually doing it is impossible. So what you would do is like you use another software which is called a trail map, or you can use, if you are programmers, you can just generate your own thing because it's again based on TensorFlow and, 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 and Python. And what it does is that over here on my uh, left-hand side, this is an uh, example, you know, like you have, um, again, because it is each section, so you know, like you have one section. Because so, what it does is that you take each plane, and it is a 3D, right? So you'll be seeing different, uh, small, 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 and then when you stitch it all up, you'll see the bigger picture. So what it does is that you have one image capture over here, 
and then you do a threshold application and then you go ahead and label that which neurons are you know like which of these are axons which of these are backgrounds which of these are projections or not so it works in the same format so what it does is that we have a software called image j which is this which i had been using to show this example to you and you load like each frame like this and then you label each frame as what is the background what is the axons what are artifacts the age of the axons and then it does in a 64 pixel uh, frame so you know like you repeat this multiple times and then you train the network and then when you train the network and then you do a something called segmentation uh, then you see that this was the original 3d projection image of a small region and you would see that the, it's quite faint you know like uh, and if you want to gather the information out of this you know like which regions manually it would be quite different but when you have the after the network has been trained and you do a segmentation map and then you generate the data out of that then you have something like this image over here which is basically the same but you see everything even more better um everything uh, in more clarity and this is something which is immensely useful in tracing the different regions uh the axons are going you know like if the axon is going from the end of the brain towards the beginning of the brain or circumventing different regions so this is immensely helpful and it can be done easily using machine learning uh this is again another example what you see over here uh, that's few of these neurons that they have stained and you can see with the heat plot that you know like uh, which regions are the neurons axons projections are more and this is a certain kind of neurons which is called the orexin neurons uh, you know like Uh, which is involved for hunger and food and you see that you know like uh, which regions you know like these neuronal projections are there saying that which regions shall be affected by this which is a very important information knowing that because if there is in the amygdala which is involved in fear learning and involved in uh, also in appetitive preference as i told during the optogenetics experiment that you have projections over there meaning that those in areas might be getting affected so and you can see beautiful mesh work of the projections and this data has been taken out from uh, the trail map um, but this is a much more refined data uh, of the trail map and uh, but you can get data like this out using machine learning uh, algorithms um and the uh, last interesting thing that i would be talking about uh, is using in animal behavior so you know like people are you from uh, any that in preclinical and clinical uh, experimental research we use mice and rats to do our analysis uh, of of experimental paradigms we run it through different behaviors and then we do behavior analysis so for example this is one of my old experiments in which you know like i had put a mice so this is how it normally works is that you have a software you put the mice there is a video tracker over there and the mice does its movements and then it track and generates a data so in this experiment what i had done was you have two objects at in a box uh, and uh, basically you replace one object with another new object uh, which is here you replace this object with a new object and then you see how the mice behaves when first you uh, make the mice train to with having two similar objects then you change one object with another object it's a very simple example of uh, of which which we use to understand the uh, cognitive ability of a mice uh, or and uh, basically if a mice is cognitively fine then it should explore the new object more because it has its innate sense of curiosity uh, and this data has been analyzed using uh, a software which is called ethovision which tracks the movement of these mice and as you can see over here from the plot of the movement uh, the control mice which is marked by wild type over here has more exploration towards the new object which uh, uh, which you change but however my experimental mice uh, did not show this same kind of pattern and tried to stay with the old object more so these tells uh, and this is uh, and this tells that in my experimental mice something is different so this kind of data analysis is fine you know like if you are using a pretty straightforward data analysis of mice movement and behavior the uh using a software package like ethovision xt or any maze there are multiple such software packages and there are a few open source as well so you know like they're still fine you know like there 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 is bonsai which is also based on python and um uh, and learning so you know like it's it's fine but then the difference comes when you have to do multiple mice over there so if you have two mice interacting with each other and two similar coat color mice both are black or both are white in color this software can't tell the difference which mice is which 
or you know like if you have a home cage experiment in which you do not want to disturb the mice from their own home cage and you want to keep the mice in their home cage and see the exploratory behavior how they're interacting with each other which is a more natural way of understanding biology because biology does not happen in isolation but in interaction uh, those things are completely not possible with uh, this proprietary softwares so here comes the importance of a new kind of software that has been developed again based on tensorflow and python is called deep lab cut um it's an open source uh, and this is basically the uh, how deep lab cut works is pretty straightforward i'll go through a few codes next page um and i feel that in the coming next 5 to 10 years uh, this is going to to be really immense because of its application not only in uh, rodents and preclinical model behavioral research but also in uh, research of any other and human beings for example so what it does is that it create a project you take a video and then grab frames from there and they have a gui as well as uh, a terminal based approach mostly works on linux but can work on windows and mac as well and then you train your network based on a neural network which is again based on tensorflow uh, to which uh, of these are uh, what the mice is doing how they are behaving and then evaluate the network performance and run the videos and it sounds very easy but then it's quite tedious because you have the labeling part and the training part is the most difficult part because after that when you have the results then plotting the results and getting it is more or less easier you can have a matlab program to get whatever information that you want to get out of that so it's pretty much fine um so a gui of it basically looks like this um is for people who have lesser programming abilities or end users uh, more like me because i am uh, not a master of programming uh, as uh, but i can do tinkering around a little bit um uh, so what it does basically it does exactly the same as you would do in a command prompt as you can see that when you run the gui then it runs on the top of a command prompt like this so basically when you click each of these is basically sending a command and and you can see the command you can actually drag it down and do some changes if you want to change some of these iterations so uh, and 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 it has uh, 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 but but the good thing of this gui is that it has exact sing like uh, a flow chart like you do it each by each and do it. and so it it has a streamlined uh, uh pipelined uh, output of what is supposed to be done so what you do basically is that you first create a project this is this is basically all the a crux of the programming that you'll be using of course you'll be doing some changes in the programmings and you know like uh, modifying them but it's more or less a 12 step approach so what you do first is that you create a project you know like the first normal thing that you would do then you add the videos so suppose the mice are moving or the rats are moving you generate a config file and this config file will tell you like what you want to label you want to label the digits of the fingers you want to label um the ear nose body this this what normally what people do uh, if you want to be more precise um and then you do something which is called a skeleton builder in which which is which is like this in which once you have labeled it then you draw and drag a skeleton and this is very important because you know like uh, once it 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 actually takes grabs the entire mice over here and when it will be running through your uh, video or your or training then uh, the entire plot is important so generating a skeleton is an important part and it can be done by simple drag and drop approach you know like it's pretty easy because uh, even though this has been you know this one this one is uh, uh the command based one you can do it pretty easy uh and then what you do is that you extract frames because when you have video then you extract each frame you know like a mice moving a little bit then a little bit and then you have to label each of them tediously and this is something that you have to do manually but once you have done that then you know you know you just uh, do uh, label the frames and then you create the training data set once you have created this training data set based on this label frames then you train the network that you know like these are my label conf this is my conf based on this config file that these are my config i have i have labeled uh, the ears the nose uh, different spine regions the tail and then you run uh, it and train the network and when you train the network you at least have 15000 to 30000 iterations in which it will go on repeating it so that you know as i told in the first the Uh, the error chances will get lesser and lesser so you can see the, so basically you are making the machine learn 
and then you do an evaluate network so what evaluate network does is that it gives back another video to show you and then you can you know like check if everything is fine or you know like or then retrain the network if you think that something is going out of uh, tune you know like it's not it's not going correctly and then once you have trained the network based on a couple of videos then what you do is that you put it on a batch of videos because when we do experiment with mice you usually have experiment with around 40 60 70 mice and then if you have to do analyzing by yourself it's it's extremely tedious particularly if you are doing uh, multiple behavior analysis so then you do an analyze video based on this neural network and the training network that you have gener generated and once you have the videos done then you have to get the information out so you convert this into trackless i'll show you a, a picture soon and once you have the tracks of the mice then you just convert it to h5 and you get the data out so it's at the end it um it, it looks something like this so when you have like this is this is basically the labeling approach when you have like it, and if you are in a gui you'll be labeling it like this if you're not then you know like you'll be labeling it to the command prompt so uh, but then anyway this window anyways opens not this if you are using the command prompt but this uh, labeling or window always opens so you label the mice and what it does over here the the beauty of this software is that it can you can have three different mice of the same coat color and it can then distinguish because you can have different markers this is yellow this is orange one is pink and you can and they will keep on tracking these mice throughout the video as separate entities and when you have that then you at the final end when you have run it through deep lab cat you have something uh, like this you know like this is mice one this is mice two this is mice three how they're interacting with each other uh, when you see the video, then you'll see uh, the uh, like these uh, points that you have plotted move around, and then you can extract the frames, and then you can extract the uh, plot out of it, like the track plots, and then you can understand, you know, how these uh, mice are interacting with each other, and whatever information that you want to get out of this. Uh, 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 this is pretty straightforward. However, uh, as I told, that training the network is immensely complicated because uh, you have to do particularly if you are doing with multiple mice. You have to do it multiple iterations and retrain and train and train and train. That requires hours of work. But once you have done it, the analysis is uh, pretty great. And this has immense application not only just in behavioral neuroscience, but people who are uh, in 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 uh, experimental research in wild animals or in other or human behavior. You know, like I remember the times when someone was someone complained that. Uh, Muthaya Muladharan doesn't ball the ball like uh, properly he, he uses and people were using different trackers uh, to check the way that he is doing to check his tracking movement but this is something which is uh, label free tracking because what you are generating are virtual labels and you can generate a complete data out of that so if any one of you are interested in such kind of analysis and not just animal behavior you can use the because it's an open source you can just use this software and you know like tinker around with it so that you can develop your own program an example over here is this racehorse uh this uh that they shown in deep lab cuts uh, file uh in which you train the uh deep lab cut to uh, note that different regions of it and when it is walking so that you know like the background and they train the network based on this and then you can have a video of it and then it tracks it throughout the video and you can use it for checking you know like in this case this was done by a person who was uh, into horse breeding and thus he wanted to see the performance of his horse and it can be done in race tracking it can be done so the applications are quite immense of uh, this kinds of machine learning approaches in 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 animal behavior and in uh, research so um, I guess like this gives a more or less a crux and an information about uh, what are the different areas that you know like uh, are happening right now in neuroscience. Like you have uh, different electrical components, people who are interested, and you don't have to when you think biomedical, you think only of human applications. But you have an immense scope, and if you're an entrepreneur, uh, particularly you have a great deal of advantage because the market is still free and. Uh, and if you are a programmer, because I know a few people uh, who uh, just did their uh, BTEC in informatics, uh, and then they came down to work for behavior analysis, and it's a full-time job to sit behind and 
do an informatic analysis of the behaviors or generate the data and it's and and particularly in pharmaceutical companies you'll require it more and more often to implement these data if you're working in animal behavior research or something this things something that you can see uh, to be used everywhere so in in overall what you know like it can be said is that experimental basic neuroscience you would see some old papers from the 90s would be mostly based on uh, molecular biology or a little bit of electrophysiology or something or uh, but not much uh, of 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 technological aspects but more and more that we are going 20 years down the line 2020 30 years down the line over here uh, we are seeing an immense growth in the application of technology and and the examples that i told you before you know like without that right now no behavior or no biology is possible so there is an immense scope of interdisciplinary research in basic neuroscience even not just in clinical neuroscience and i hope that i had uh, get given my point across and if you have any questions you know, like please uh, just uh, shoot hello hello yes uh yes sir uh, let me check actually yeah so open to questions yeah i'm open to questions okay okay means uh, i had one question sure go ahead dr amol like as a part of curiosity curiosity mm -hmm. how does this optogenetics or uh, fiber photometry works is it similar mm -hmm. to photoplethysmography uh well like, i am yeah uh, yeah you saying something because it is also based on the principle of light it means blood flow through the vessels yeah something like yeah that. yeah exactly uh, over there you'll be detecting like any of these techniques you know like uh, pet scan or or, or what the one that you are talking about so they do the same but here uh, what it does is that you are directly affecting the function of a neuron or uh, based on light because you are uh, expressing a protein in the neurons extraneously so this changes the physiology of the neurons and when you shine light it just causes the neurons to fire or stop firing so this is what how optogenetics does and what you do in uh, but but the analysis component like when i told about the optros is almost the same because you do the same the blood flow analysis i guess uh, by checking the light through and how they are changing how the phenotype is changing the same uh, but then the thing is that over there you'll be checking mostly uh, non engineered let's say like this non engineered uh, cells uh, or non engineered tissue but here they have been engineered so if you have not engineered them if you have not expressed specifically this protein called channel node hops in this neuron they will not do any effect so just shining light on them will not have any effect but only because this protein is expressing that you are changing the physiology of there and that's what you are right now uh, analyzing okay okay uh, so one more is there sir how neuromorph computation and neuroscience mm -hmm. is related neuromorphic computation and neuroscience uh neuromorphic computation um other wait uh, i'll i'll take up from there yeah uh so uh in, in case of neuromorphic uh, computation uh, or, or or particularly uh, uh, uh neuroscience so when you see of neuromorphic computing basically what i told is that the, you remember my first slide in which i was talking about um this uh three transistor model right of the neuron uh wait uh, maybe i can just um wait maybe i can just go back to present and uh yeah okay uh so uh, let's go back to the first slide over here yeah so when you see over here is that uh, this is the example of a neuron in which it has been designed through a three transistor model so what is corresponding over here is a fast spiking neuron uh, which are typical of gabagic neurons in the brain which are there 
so when you have a model of this and you have different such models then you generate a model of a neuron and this is what people had been trying to do is that mimic the function of the brain this is what i said in the beginning you know like this were the uh, crux of neurocomputing and uh, earlier and you know like uh, and even right now in which what people try to design are artificial neurons based on these same principle and then when you give a stimulus and then it works out so this this is also a very active area of research but it has been there for quite some time right now and uh, by, uh, and uh, people have been trying to develop uh, artificial brains or artificial systems uh, based on this so so yeah you know like that's uh, that's an important part of neuroscience but when i'm uh, but that's a more important part of an application based neuroscience you know like if you're an, uh, more of into electronic components or something this is what you'll be mostly interested in uh, or or brain machine interface for that sense you know like that that's again uh, based on a, a circuit diagram which is called a circuit diagram like this but when you come to clinical neuroscience you have to first understand how the neurons are connected to each other to generate a circuit map like this so at the end of the day we are all working towards a common goal uh, to understand how to generate uh, the brain map or a complex map like of the brain function and these are all aiding towards that so are generating an artificial brain yes that might be uh, the final goal uh, and these small techniques that i told are aiding towards understanding that because you need to put each of this informations in to when you are generating a, a proper brain and i feel that with the advancement of technology it can be more easier because you will not have just the input and the output but also you have to couple it to the behavioral changes and how the different networks interacting with each other so yeah if i have answered the question yes uh, professor vivek would like to go for extension of your question okay uh so maybe means uh, if you can extend like what whole new world of uh, opportunities are opened up uh, through this optogenetics or uh, fiber photometry uh what we can see right now is that it is right now used in every lab uh in india particularly i am i am yet to see <laughs> mostly because of the uh, but it's not that we don't have money we have a lot of money uh, but still it is to be implemented somehow at least when i was leaving the country 4 years back this technique was not established anywhere but when you come abroad it's used everywhere right now it tells because people have uh, this is something that i feel that it's going to have immense use uh, particularly optogenetics uh, it's, it's still a long shot but it can be used uh, in treating patients uh, even with psychiatric disorders or or making a brain machine interface later on of people who have neurological issues but that's still a long shot it's still an experimental design right now and that's exactly the reason we need to refine it so what fiber photometry optogenetics and optros they do all together are basically refining the same techniques because in optogenetics what you uh, do is that you express this virus you express into this entire region entire population of neurons but you don't want to do that you want to express in a sub population of neurons and this is what exactly fiber photometry does fiber photometry gets the information of which sub population of neurons are actually firing uh, so you do not express in all the neurons but this population of neurons so suppose you you see an image and then this image creates a memory map in your head uh and these are based on certain neurons firing in a certain region of the brain suppose hippocampus only certain neurons fire not all of them so manipulating all of them genetically will is not something that you want you just want to manipulate only those small so what we see in future is that these kinds of selective manipulation that will enable us to recreate the memory uh implant memory you know like all sky fi things but this is what uh, people had been doing right now and and a lot of this is not science fiction but is proper science people have been trying to create uh, artificial memory people have been trying to create the trace back the same exact memory by seeing the sequence of the information flowing through the brain uh, using this fiber photometry and uh, optogenetics and uh, there is one else shall go ahead me after it uh no no just i was about to ask if anyone else is going like to ask no i just in continuation yeah. to what uh, uh, she said oh, yes. in india it is not possible or it has not been done so what are the main difficulties 
No, I, no, I don't. I would not say that it cannot be done. I just think that you know, like, uh, not anyone has picked it up right now. Uh, so I feel that you know, like, it requires uh, you to set up uh, the. It's it's absolutely no difficult at all. You know, like, with I I I I personally believe that we have got enough resources, enough talents, uh, and particularly a country which is mostly focused on engineering and medicine. Uh, we don't have any uh, dearth so of it. Hardware wise, yeah, hardware wise, me, what are the kind of costs involved? Me, hardware, me, what is the main thing you need? Like yeah, so, so yeah, exactly. So this is exactly the reason I told that people who might be interested in entrepreneurship, this is an uh, excellent area because uh, there is only one lab right now because this Thor Labs or there are some other small small labs coming up, but it has made such a monopoly market that whenever whatever you want to buy components from there. Like each of these optros or these optical fiber cables or the implants, they are quite costly. You know, like it's not something cheap like LED dyes or uh, though the principle is 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 easy, but then it's not something very cheap. You would be spending quite uh, thousands of dollars to set up. You know, like just one experiment. You know, like and they are fragile because you are putting on a moving mice, so they can break. So if it breaks, then you'll have to buy again from them. So you know, like so you know, like one experiment in which you are doing with some thirty forty mice can run into a couple of thousands of dollars. Mm-hmm. Or, or you know, like a uh, few lakhs of, or more than few lakhs of rupees. So this is something which is uh, a limitation right now. Because, like for me, it's like you know, like for going into uh, developing countries like India or any every lab doing this kinds of experiments. You know, like that's the limitation. But if you make the components cheaper, like the opto T cheaper or the uh, optical components cheaper, with mass production, this is possible. Or with more players coming out in the market, it's possible. You can design your homegrown stuff. People do it sometimes because it's sometimes so expensive for Thor Labs. People do it. We used to do it in my previous institute. We used to generate uh, our own designed optos, but then again, they are not uh, quality controlled, right? So when you are, you know, like publishing a paper or something, uh, people would be saying that you know, like, was it quality controlled? So then you have to run a quality control experiment by yourself, which again will go into a lot of money. And so sometimes people feel it preferable to buy it from the companies. So I guess like that's the major limitation. Uh, but i feel that you know like uh, institutes like um, in ncbs uh, my previous institute in india ccmb uh, nbrc in gurgaon they are looking forward to this and i feel that optogenetic setup should be coming down to india and fiber photometry should be coming to india very soon okay thank you no worries you are most welcome any other question from participants Okay. The morning session itself. Uh, the first speaker mentioned that uh, Elon Musk is uh, planning to work in this direction, and very soon means he will be in a position to download the thoughts of a human to maybe a. Yeah, US I, I, <laughs> I, I, I would, I would say that that is quite far fetched. I don't see that's happening in the next ten, fifteen years to download the thoughts. But yes, you know, like the advancement of the field is going crazily. You know, like uh, you know, right now that you know there has been few labs in Japan and a uh, few labs in the U.S. where you they put you inside an MRI machine and uh, they give you a setup for present of images, like uh, and and then they try to get the map of your brain, an MRI or fMRI map of your brain, and then they try to use machine learning to see what you have been thinking. So in yes, you know, like. Uh, if it comes to like it's preliminary <coughs> but yes it's possible so there are some neurons which is called the jennifer aniston neurons actually you know like this was done because someone was presented a picture of jennifer aniston and you know like those neurons started firing up you know like when jennifer aniston's images were there and that's the reason people started to recreate this so you know like yes there are immense opportunities possibilities machine learning is something which is going to help in all of these and maybe in the future we will be able to do this particularly in people who are coming from ptsd or any of these Diseases, or 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 if you are dreaming and you want to interpret your dream, you don't have to go to you know like uh, trying to think. You can just go and sit inside the MRI machine and you can just get your dream sorted out. Yes, yes. So I think if there are no more questions, uh, we can go ahead. So is the screen visible? Yes, it's visible. Thank you so much. So thank you, thank you very much, uh, Doctor Shila Ditya, right. for uh, accepting our invitation for- and. Uh, uh having a very nice uh, session to all of us so it was a, a new uh, rather a new field for all of us rather many of us and uh, please accept this 
uh, virtual moment from all oh, of us uh, yes. right sure from spit so and much. our team thank you so much thank you yes yes, yes. thank you thank you thank you iladitya thank you thank okay, you sir. so i'll find off then and um, you guys have a great uh, uh, session i feel that it has been going on great and yes, hopefully yes. You know, like people will be inspired to come into uh, research more often and and have more research industry tie ups than just Correct. you know like science so that is, is the main objective is different yes and i feel that here in germany they're doing a lot so i hope india does the same too Correct. great thank you so much thank you thank you very much good day